All right, we'll start at the beginning again. I'd like to acknowledge that we meet this afternoon on the traditional lands of the Mohican people, and their histories, past and present, are inextricably intertwined with all that made it possible for us to be here today at a place called the Clark. To start, we're going to have a paper presented on Mexico City and the Academy of San Carlos. Professor Ray Hernandez Duran is from the University of New Mexico, and he's going, his research focuses on 18th century art from colonial New Spain, as well as the 19th century Mexican art and museography, as well as art historiography. Our second paper, and they're going to roll just from one straight to the other, will be by Paul Neal, who's associate professor in the Department of Art History at Florida State University. His research focuses on architectural history and visual culture from the Caribbean, particularly Spanish-speaking islands in the colonial period. And he's going to take us to Havana and focus on the Academy of San Alejandro. Um, I'll watch the clock so they don't keep us from coffee, but I'm going to trust them to keep their own time. So Ray, and you want to take the stage. Well, thank you for that introduction, Dana. And good afternoon to everyone. Now that we've had some lunch and a little caffeine, I think we're all ready for the afternoon presentations. Uh, I'd like to, uh, before launching into my, my paper, of course, uh, thank the Clark Art Institute for hosting this event and for the staff members involved in making this possible. And a special thanks to Claudia and to Yukio for extending an invitation to me to participate. I can't tell you how excited I am to be around people who I can talk to about the academy. <laughs> back, back home, there's no one who works on this or has any interest in it, so I'm beside myself. Okay. All right. Let me put this here. All right. So, let me get my pointer, make sure I'm all set. So in 1799, in a letter to the Spanish Viceroy, Miguel José de Asanza Alegría, the directors of painting at the Academy of San Carlos in Mexico City concerned over the production and circulation of religious images by non-academic painters wrote the following, quote, it fills us with horror to see the dishonor and the abuses introduced into the branch of painting through the ignorance of Indians, Spaniards, and blacks who aspire without any foundation or rules to imitate the most sacred of images, end quote. The statement briefly outlining concerns over stylistic propriety and unregulated art production underlines the Academy's presumed authority, not only in terms of artistic training, but also the production of religious art. It too suggests the nascent institution's role as a tool of the Spanish viceregal government, whose responsibilities, or at least a major portion of them, would include attending to the Catholic Church's demands and the religious cult's needs. This dual institutional focus tied to a centuries-long relationship between crown and church would structure much of the academy's function during the last four decades of Spanish colonial rule. More importantly, the focus on religious subject matter and academic art would weather the disruption of the independence movement and the processes of secularization that followed. Its persistence would reflect both the continuing dominance of the church in Mexican society and the partisan politics that would develop by the mid 19th century. Referring to the critical evaluation of Nicholas Pevsner's work on the 19th century art academy, and specifically of Pevsner's disavowal of local influences on the academic institution, Paul Neal, writing about the Academy of San Alejandro in Havana, Cuba, noted that, quote, the consequence of this apathy towards the local is that while Pevsner does provide an important critique of the organizational framework of the academies and their relation to nationalism, by removing concerns for locality, there is an over-reliance on the notion of academies as closed, regulatory, and systematic institutions impervious to social and cultural contingencies." End quote. Similarly, Martin Prusler, examining the development of the modern museum and its diffusion outside of Europe, noted that, quote, 
the third world has to be taken thoroughly into account if one is to gain a truly global perspective, but it is here that the conceptual limitations are most in evidence." End quote. With these observations in mind, I propose that a project that examines the implementation of the Western European academic model in the Indo-Hispanic Americas must begin with the Academy of San Carlos Foundation in the late 18th century through at least the mid 19th century if the aim is to understand how the peculiarities of the Mexican environment shaped the institution and its function. Examining the Mexican Art Academy during the first century of its existence reveals how institutional practices reflected first imperial and later national political ideologies in terms of the perceived significance of Catholicism in Mexican society and religious subject matter in academic art production. The idea of an art academy in the late 18th century in Mexico City, originally conceived as un estudio público de artes, or a public art studio, was proposed in 1781 by Fernando José Mangino, superintendent of the Royal Mint, to the viceroy, Matías de Galvez, who we see here. Uh, this is uh, represent, a portrait of the viceroy, represented as a patron of the academy. Uh, there's kind of a charitable theme in, in this portrait where we see a group of young boys in tatters uh, and his hand outstretched over them. And in the background, we see a group of boys nicely dressed participating in the academy. Uh, when the academy was established, uh, several spots were reserved both for indigenous boys and there were also scholarships set up uh, to help support uh, poor students uh, in the academy. Okay. The Royal Academy of the Three Noble Arts architecture, painting, and sculpture, inspired by the work of Jerónimo Antonio Gil, who we see represented, very problematic character, nobody liked him, he caused a lot of problems, and his colleagues were always complaining about him. There was a huge scandal uh, that I uncovered in the archive of letters written by his uh, faculty colleagues complaining about him. So the Royal Academy, inspired by the work of Jerónimo Antonio Gil, master engraver to the king, who had been sent to New Spain in 1778 to supervise the training of engravers in Mexico City, was considered beneficial to the state and to society given the success of the Academy of San Fernando in Madrid, whose achievements were seen as, quote, contributing to the honor of the Spanish nation and to its decorum, end quote. And the Academy of San Fernando in Madrid uh, was uh, founded just 30 years before San Carlos, around 1752 officially. In 1782, Gil submitted a request for the hire of professors of painting, sculpture, and architecture, as well as for a collection of plaster cast reproductions of important ancient and Renaissance sculptures. The colonial painter, Jose de Alcibar, had already donated a group of paintings to the new academy, four religious images identified as belonging to the schools of Surbaran and Michelangelo. In December 1783, the Spanish king, Charles III, officially approved the request and ordered the hiring of faculty, the provision of furniture and other materials, and the drafting of statutes. The royal order announcing the foundation of the academy was publicized in 1784, and once the statutes were drafted a year later, they were circulated widely throughout the viceroyalty, not only to city and town councils, but also to church officials, including the archbishop, Bishops, bishops and leading religious orders. The Academy's primary objective was to, quote, modernize Spain's American territories whose art and architecture had been judged by newly appointed Bourbon officials as deficient and obsolete. This objective consisted of several distinct yet related aims, among them, concentrating artistic training in the school as a counter to the myriad independent workshops populating the capital, Introducing students and thus the region to buen gusto, i.e. good taste, what today we identify as a form of neoclassicism, in an attempt to erase the older churrigueresco style seen as out of date, in bad taste, and not aligned with current imperial principles. Regulating art and architectural production to ensure that the art produced was correct and in line with the dominant official vision and reinforcing imperial ideology, social order, and allegiance through the production of propagandistic imagery in the form of public monuments, prints, and coins, including religious works. One of the things that, uh, in terms of the academy, uh, much of the scholarship uh, 
has traditionally focused uh, in its four, first four decades of existence, that is in the late colonial period. Uh, the academy in the 19th century still needs a lot of work, but one of the things that the scholarship that focuses on the academy uh, uh, in the late 18th century has not really addressed is the fact that the academy is founded during a period of revolutions. The American Revolution had just happened, the Haitian Revolution had just happened, and the Spanish monarchy was uh, uh, really uh, tense. Uh, and concerned that it might possibly lose its American territories. And there's like a culture of paranoia that you find in the Bourbon court. You know, they're seeing possible insurrections all over the place. So the academy is founded right during this period and uh, uh, much of its function uh, is related to attempts by the monarchy as we're gonna see to ameliorate, you know, uh, these political tensions that have been developing. Okay. In addition to civic architectural projects, the academy concentrated its attention on religious structures where changes were mainly seen in the redesigning of facades, the repainting of interiors, and the altering or replacing of altarpieces and religious paintings. Thomas Brown describes academy sculptor Manuel Tolsa, his redesign of the altarpieces in Puebla and Mexico City as, quote, a destructive and constructive activity at the same time, since he stripped them of their Baroque richness and replaced it with neoclassical motifs, end quote. So the churrigueresco style, which is typically associated uh, with sort of a Baroque aesthetic, was seen as out of fashion and not in line with imperial politics. Uh, one of the functions of the academy was to remove sort of this Baroque uh, uh, aesthetic, these Baroque facades, the Baroque paintings and altarpieces and replace them with uh, more neoclassical uh, uh, images and motifs. From 1785 until approximately 1825, the academy flourished as the leading art institution in the Spanish American territories. During this 30 year period, as the architectural fabric of the Nova Hispanic capital was transformed by new construction and various redesign projects, academic painting following the practice of the academy in Madrid and other European cultural centers focused on history, religious subjects and portraiture. An example of religious painting from this period is the monumental panel by Rafael Jimeno y Planes, the director of painting at the Academy. The painting, titled El Milagro del Posito, or The Miracle of the Fountain, or The Spring, was intended for the chapel of the Palacio de Minería, the mining palace, a neoclassical structure built to house a mining school, and it depicts, in an academic history format, an episode from the story of the apparition of the Virgin of Guadalupe to the Indian, Juan Diego, in 1531. In the painting, three figural groups inhabit a rocky landscape representing the hill of Tepeyac, the site of the event, which is located north uh, of Mexico City. Uh, the main group is centered on the figure of Juan de Sumarraga, the first archbishop of Mexico, who points to a fountain of water that has miraculously appeared from a stone. He is flanked by religious officials and a group of peninsulars or creoles. Meanwhile, Juan Diego, dressed in red, can be seen kneeling beside him. To the right of the central figures, we see a group of natives gathered next to a tree, but it is the figural group to our left that is of interest. And I'm referring, oops, sorry. I'm referring to this triad right here. Standing on a wagon is a white male figure that faces away from us and directs his attention to Sumarraga. The figure raises his arm in response to the archbishop who is addressing him as he points to the spring. Seated on the wagon, directly behind the standing figure, Right here is a darker skinned individual, possibly indigenous or mestizo, who rests his foot on the black back of a black man, right here, lying on the ground partially beneath the wagon. The racial content and the hierarchical arrangement appear to reference the caste system of New Spain, particularly as codified in Pinturas de Casta. Originating in response to the demographic peculiarities of the distant viceroyalty, Pinturas de Casta depict in formulaic fashion the results of miscegenation between Spaniards, Indians, and Blacks. A genre of painting produced or introduced in the early 18th century, possibly earlier, cast paintings predate the academy and developed independently of the academic institution. As such, they did not correspond to the types of academic subjects that were recognized by and promoted at San Carlos. The production of Casta paintings not coincidentally diminished and ultimately disappeared once the academy was founded. Jimeno y Planes' reformulation of a local narrative and its pictorial equivalent illustrates the effect, or at least one of the effects, of new academic criteria in colonial art production. 
His insertion of Augusta reference in the representation of an event that presumably occurred a decade after the conquest was anomalous to both the reference time period and the story as traditionally depicted. The fact that the narrative illustrated in the painting was tied to a religious icon that had taken on political symbolism by the late 18th century uh, has led certain scholars to suggest that this painting may possibly signal Jimeno Planes, who was Spanish, that it may possibly signal his support of Mexican independence, given the privileged position of the Creole figure in this interpretation of one of Mexico's foundational myths, and also when viewed in its uh, uh, temporal context you know, politics are infused through much of the art production. So uh, what I'm showing you here is, uh, this is an earlier 18th century image of the Virgen de Guadalupe, which is typical in representations of the Virgin and the narrative episodes that are part of her story. But as you can tell, it's really a devotional image and the narrative itself is uh, framed in these small cartouches that are located in the corners. I mean, the focus is the Virgin. Uh, there's a devotional function to this image. And this subject matter then is reformulated and accommodated to an academic history painting. And what we see happening is that this relationship gets reversed. Uh, the apparition itself is in the background. And what becomes a, a sort of the focus here is the, the narrative and the historical actors. This is a very important shift, and I think it ties into some of the things that we were talking about earlier in terms of how academic uh, uh, practice uh, didn't just introduce new ways uh, uh, of making or teaching, but also creating new subjectivities. And there's more, a lot more to say about this. Okay. All right. So the transition from Spanish vice royalty to modern nation was turbulent and destabilized the region economically and politically for decades. The United States invasion of Mexico in 1846 and the subsequent annexation of the northern half of Mexican territory in 1848 further debilitated the beleaguered nation. The Academy of San Carlos, which had opened its doors to great fanfare and had enjoyed both royal and local support, flourished until approximately 1821, the year that Mexico declared its independence from Spain. Given the political and economic instability occasioned by civil war, Mexico faced serious financial challenges which inevitably affected the academy. During this period, circa 1822 to 1835, student enrollments diminished and faculty salaries disappeared, causing the academy to shut its doors. Foreign visitors to Mexico City during this period lamented the state of both the academy and art in the country. William Bullock, a British traveler who spent six months in Mexico in 1822, and then again in 1827 wrote the following, quote, not one landscape or architectural painter remains in this great city, and the only few artists are those who copy religious subjects for the churches, but they are deplorably bad, end quote. 10 years later, in 1834, another visitor from London, Charles Joseph Latrobe wrote, quote, the Academy of Arts at the time of our visit was in a state of general neglect shameful to the government and people. The museum presents a scene of great interest, as besides a multitude of rare and unique works illustrative of the history of the country, yet all are in the most appalling disorder. For two centuries, the same insane and bigoted spirit of wanton destruction, which the Spanish historians note influenced the conquerors, seems to have influenced their descendants to a very late epoch, if not the present day." End quote. The big comment there. In 1843, the dire situation began to change when provisional president Antonio Lopez de Santana initiated the renovation of the academy, which reopened in 1846. However, the cultural and political climate in the 1840s was significantly different than that of the late viceregal period. After 1848, politics in independent Mexico had gradually crystallized around parties whose relationships were largely defined by opposing liberal and conservative agendas. The conservative party, which had emerged in response to the repeated liberal failures of the 1820s and 30s, took form through the 1840s and was officially inaugurated as a party in 1849. Two central disagreements between the conservatives and liberals involved the role of the Catholic Church and government in Mexican society, as well as the content and structure of Mexican history. Whereas the liberals, 
who were looking outside of Mexico for new political models, believed in the separation of church and state. Conservatives felt the church had an important role to play in government and Mexican political life. Similarly, whereas liberals recognized the pre-conquest indigenous societies, the Aztec, as the foundation of the Mexican nation, conservatives felt that Mexican history began with the Spanish conquest, not earlier, and that Hispanicized Creoles, these are American-born Spaniards, were the primary actors who led the nation's development from that period on. From the 1840s through the 1850s, conservatives dominated the intellectual societies and cultural institutions in the capital, including the academy. As a bastion of conservatism, following its reopening, San Carlos served as a tool for the promotion of conservative ideals. As the Academy of San Carlos was being remodeled and its inauguration planned, so we're thinking 1843 to 1845, a competition was held in Europe for a new professor of painting. Among the applicants from Italy, Germany, and France was the Spaniard Pellegrin Clave. Art historian Esther Acevedo suggested that the Mexican official, Jose Montoya, who was charged with hiring the new painting instructor, hired Clave in large part due to his Catholic affiliation. Clave was offered the position, and in 1846, he relocated to Mexico City. As a student, Clave had earlier traveled to Rome, where he encountered the Nazarenes, of course, a group of primarily German and Austrian artists led by Johann Friedrich Overbeck. Formed in the early 19th century, the Nazarenes, emulating the religious art of the medieval and Renaissance periods, were enamored with the work of the Italian primitives and highly critical of what they perceived to be the superficial technical virtuosity that had come to dominate European painting at that time. By the 1840s, however, their brand of painting had begun to fall into disfavor in Europe. But in Mexico, the Nazarene movement would find new life thanks to the conservative ideology dominating the academy, which was favorable to the Nazarene ideas informing Clave's work. In Mexico City, Clave primarily focused on history and religious painting and on promoting the Nazarene principles he'd learned as a student. This body of work, unlike earlier religious painting, was not meant to be devotional, but rather allegorical and didactic. Mexican art historian Fausto Ramirez Rojas observed that although academy students did paint classical and historical themes, the vast majority of work produced during this period focused on sacred history, where Old Testament subjects were allegorical and understood as standing in for recent historical events. He suggested, for example, that Mexicans saw the United States invasion of Mexico and the loss of national territory reflected in the stories of the Hebrews in Babylon with whom they identified as they faced and lost to a more powerful aggressor that continued to pose a threat. You know, I had a chance to read a lot of President Polk's writings and uh, the United States had considered absorbing the entire country. You know, it's, there's a whole lecture to give just in those letters that were written and what Mex uh, the U.S. was initially thinking of doing. So the, the Mexican fear uh, of more uh, invasive kind of expeditions by the U.S. was uh, uh, valid. Juan Gutierrez Aces noted that the conservative leaders, or at least four conservative leaders like Jose Bernardo Cotto, uh, who we see right here, um, he was the director of the Mexican Academy in the 1850s, and he was also the creative mind behind the Gallery of Colonial Painting at San Carlos. You know, that she stated that for conservative leaders like Goto, religion not only represented a central component of Mexican identity, but could also serve to unify the colonial period with the current national context, resolving any perceived historical, political, or cultural disjuncture in the turbulent transition from viceroyalty to nation. In other words, there would be one continuous Mexican school of painting from the 16th century through the present with religious subject matter as the link across time. Discussing Goto's colonial painting gallery, uh, which consisted mainly of religious works gathered from churches and convents, and the conservative view of religion and history, Gutierrez Aces described the Academy of San Carlos as, quote, el único lazo de unión entre las dos épocas y las dos escuelas, or the sole unifying link between the two periods and the two schools, end quote. 
Given that Clave's objectives included restructuring the painting program at the academy and guiding the creation of a modern national school of painting, with the old Mexican school of painting now defined, thanks to Coto, the emerging modern school would have a historical predecessor. This new reading would suggest a coherent, continuous national narrative that stretched back to the conquest, reflecting the conservative view of that event as marking the origin of Mexico's history and highlighting the importance of religion to Mexican values and national identity. So in closing, for close to two decades, Clave and his students produced paintings focused on biblical subjects. However, the period of conservative dominance would start to wane by the end of the 1850s, beginning with the ratification of the liberal constitution of 1857. Among the new constitution's dictates was the prohibition against the promotion of dogma by government institutions, a law that conflicted with the production of religious images at the academy. As liberals gained political ground in the decade that followed, particularly after the short-lived conservative-backed second Habsburg Imperium uh, came to an abrupt conclusion in 1867, the conservative hold over the academy ended and liberals again dominated the political and cultural spheres in the capital. In 1868, Clave returned to Spain and one of his students, Jose Salome Pina, who had been studying in Rome and absorbing current trends, returned and assumed his position as director of the painting at the academy. Pina's return to San Carlos reflected a turning point by shifting the focus in academic painting from religion to secular themes and local history. This development brought the Mexican Academy up to speed with coeval academic practice in Europe effectively closing the chapter on conservative dominance in the Mexican capital and the academy. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'd like to thank Dana for the introduction, and uh, it is a great honor and pleasure to be here. Um, I can only echo Ray's sentiments that I felt somewhat um, atomized myself looking at the academy, particularly in the Caribbean, and I can only thank Claudia and, um, and Yukio for bringing us together, uh, this rich array of papers um, and, and distinguished scholars that make us feel a little less alone in the world, and um, to Caroline and uh, the Clark for generously hosting us. And now I shall take us to the Caribbean. Let's see where it is. Ah, oh, here it is. Great. In January of 1819, Spanish royal officials and members of the elite public oversaw the opening of an Academy of Natural Drawing at the convent of St. Augustine in the city of Havana, Cuba. The crowd gathered in the convent's refectory, which had been prepared and adorned for the occasion. The Memorias de la Sociedad Económica de Amigos del País de la Habana, hereafter I will refer to as simply the Memorias, the journal published by the, the city's Economic Society of the Friends of the Country, extolled the new school, proclaiming that, quote, all the sciences and arts uh, receive help from drawing and painting. These skills facilitate the intelligence of that which is written, present models of how much is desired, and remind us of the, he the history of the heroes of the most remote century." Unquote. The author of this passage goes on to stress the essential place of drawing in the production of the Bellas Artes, the fine arts, and frames the academy as a commitment to the education of the youth in a matter of public responsibility. In addition to unveiling new artistic ideals, the event served to reify a nascent form of civil society composed of reformist Spanish administrators, elite clergy, and the economic society itself, which was founded in 1791. This organization, dominated by the landed elite and emerging class of professionals, devoted much of its time to the study of the quote-unquote improvement of the city. The academy would eventually take the name San Alejandro after the Spanish economist Alejandro Ramirez, 
the intendant to Puerto Rico, and the supervisor of the Crown's finances in Cuba in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Spain's financial ministers typically ingratiated themselves to the Creole, island-born elite of the Americas during this period, a population eager to promote the economic development of their cities and territories. The Drawing Academy of the early 19th century speaks to the local adaptation of a key aspect of the Spanish Enlightenment, that is the institutionalization of artistic practices exemplified by the Royal Academy of San Fernando in Madrid, established in 1752, as Ray just mentioned, along with San Carlos in Valencia, 1768, and San Luis in Saragossa, 1793. The first colonial academy in the Spanish Americas, San Carlos in Mexico City, founded in 1783, resulted from the initiative of Spanish printmaker Jerónimo Antonio Gil, who, who had arrived several years earlier from Madrid to take charge of the Royal Mint. This pattern of an academically trained European ushering in the fine arts to an American metropolis was echoed in Havana, in which the French expatriate artist Jean-Baptiste Verme arrived to the city in 1815, several years before the opening of the Academy uh, of Drawing that the Economic Society placed under his auspices. As the Memorias makes clear, the society considered the advent of a drawing school as a major step forward in bringing the city's ilustrados, enlightened ones, closer to the paradigm of reason, progress, Western civilization, and the cultivation of buen gusto, good taste, that would elevate the city above mere custom or tradition, and those words are in quotes. A range of late 18th century developments in Cuba laid the groundwork for these early 19th century transformations in the visual arts of Havana. Spanish Governor Luis de las Casas, who founded the Economic Society in the early 1790s, did so at approximately the same moment that the Caribbean began to experience decisive political and economic shifts. A massive slave rebellion in the neighboring French colony of Saint-Domingue, later known as the Haitian Revolution, disrupted French dominance in Atlantic world sugar production. Cubans responded actively to this change by petitioning the Spanish crown to lift its centuries-old regulations on access to the transatlantic slave trade and to allow for unfettered slave imports. A doctrine of free trade emerged in Cuba, authored by local elites and selectively adapting important aspects of British political economy tailored to the realities of a Caribbean extraction zone. With an increase in the African population of the island, elite social formation turned decisively in the direction of delineation between the racial dichotomies of white and black in published discourses, even as the realities on the streets involved a heterogeneous population perceived to themselves as racially mixed. This revised discourse of colonial exclusion emerged at roughly the same time that the economic society began to intensify its campaigns for cultural improvements on the island. Foreshadowing this event in the portrait of Las Casas, the governor addresses the viewer directly, instructing Abaneros to protect humanity, enlighten the country. These two streams, that of racial conflict and cultural transformation, began to merge as evident in society publications and the initiatives that unfolded thereafter. Art historian Albert Bohem's notion of the Fine Arts Academy as a, quote, pedagogic and honorific institution, unquote, through which the French bourgeoisie amassed symbolic and cultural capital over the working proletariat who they aimed to, quote, unquote, correct, provides a useful way of thinking about San Alejandro in Havana, albeit from a Eurocentric perspective. In Cuba, while the means of correct training in the arts of buen gusto bore similarities to Europe, the nature of social class formation in this regard unfolded differently in, a, in the Caribbean, in which slavery and race played indispensable roles in the organization and functioning of capitalist society. In this presentation, I first examined the 1832 reglamento, the regulations of San Alejandro to glean insights into pedagogical practices. The Havana elite viewed the reformation of institutions as vehicles for the city's alignment with narratives of Western achievement and the consumption and performance of good taste. I then consider various chapters in the Memorias on both the topics of the fine arts and racial whitening, subject, subjects that frequently appear in the same volume of these publications, sometimes back to back. 
As such, racial and aesthetic improvement in early 19th century Havana appear to have been perceived as equal components of a larger agenda of progress and modernity in general. I argue that these reforms and practices were wholly integrated as part of a colonial matrix of power that worked to manage and control artistic practices, uh, their products and their receptions, a dynamic that we might consider the coloniality of aesthetics. My interest here is part of a larger conversation about how late 18th century Western aesthetics functioned in the colonial situations that they co-constituted, and as regimes of artistic and sensory management with class, racial, and gendered implications. In this sense, I'm interested in the darker side of aesthetics, not the artistic beauty that they confer, but the inequalities that they create and the oppressions that they conceal behind the experience of artistic enchantment. A system of workshops seems to have dominated late colonial art production in Havana, although our records are sparse on the operation of workshops and guilds in the city. Literary scholar Sybil Fisher has argued that the quote-unquote popular painters of this era were largely men of African descent from the city's multitude of free blacks operating in a post-Haitian revolution Atlantic world with its important implications for their lives and work. Prominent among such painters was Vicente Escobar, who produced portraits of, and religious paintings such as this one of Hakis Quiroga, a noted free black musician in the city of Matanzas. If these men represented the sea of artistic production in Havana, the new drawing academy of San Alejandro was an island indeed, a small exclusive enclave designed to teach academically correct art at the dawn of the quote unquote second slavery of the 19th century Atlantic world, or at least so it seems at this point in the state of our understanding of this institution. The reglamento, the regulations of the free academy of drawing and painting of San Alejandro of 1832, conveys this, the administrative structure of the school a decade after its initial opening. This document conveys how the school's designers envisioned the discipline expected of the fine arts to be instilled through a regulated pedagogy. The society gave its education section the responsibility of the academy's staffing and teaching standards, demanding its, of its officers the qualities of honesty, zeal, and prudence. There would be a director, among, of, a director of the academy among its professors, named by the education section, a person of good conduct to ensure that students acquired the essentials of drawing, which are given as correction, good taste, elegance, character, expression, and perspective. The society would employ a portero, a concierge or custodian, to properly look after the needful things of the academy, such as pictures, furniture, and other equipment. An accurate inventory would be formed of all the academy's stocks in terms of models, tables, and utensils, which would be renewed every two years. The director and portero would sign the inventory with the endorsement of the principal curator, and an authorized copy would be conveyed to the society's accounting office. In terms of the enrollment of 1832, the academy would consist of 120 students, divided into two established sections, separated by two salons. One section addressing um, the principles of pencil and washing, and the other, the imitation of plaster figures and natural objects in paint and pencil, al fumino, or to the light. Instruction would proceed every afternoon of the year except holidays with at least four students working for an hour and a half. Study student work would be subject to examination and exhibition annually on the Sunday closest to July 14th in order for it to coincide with the general meeting of the Economic Society. The drawing and painting of the students would be left up for public view for three days, and prizes would consist of gold and silver pens with their corresponding inscription, along with a certificate from the education section. Qualified professors, the president of the section, the secretary, and curators would verify the works as passable three days prior to the public exam. The reglamento specifies that the academy would have one principal curator who would wield his authority as, quote, a diligent father of a family, unquote, ensuring good customs, focus, and a decent demeanor of employees and students, taking note of defects, and punishing transgressions. This principal curator would require cédulas de entrada, entry cards, to ensure that students had the necessary qualities according to articles one and two of chapter four of the reglamento and to call out imposters who would only pretend to be students of the academy. 
The regulations required a student to be at least 12 years of age, classified racially as white, someone of good manners, and probably male, although gender is not specified. An applicant would be presented to the principal associate curator with proof of baptism to valorize their claimed identities, and the curator would thereby dispatch an entry card to the student if that student met the requirement of the reglamento. Students were to occupy the place to which the director assigned them in one of the two salons, and they should carry out their exercises in the principles of art and upon the model numbered and appointed to them without ever varying from their position or touching other models in the academy. In concert with ongoing economic reform in Spain and the American colonies, artistic practices at early San Alejandro embraced values of time and spatial discipline as essential to the school's success. The control of movement, the surveillance of students, and the regulations on the sensoriality of space would theoretically, at least, ensure that only white students were, were learning in the salons and in disciplined ways. Through rigorous training, each student was expected to internalize an economy of practice as they developed their sense of taste, which presumably set them above the popular painters in the workshops outside of the academy. There is a performative dimension to consider here, a construction or reconfiguration of white performativity in 19th century Cuba, not only in terms of artistic practices, but also in social comportment generally. It is to say that the dialectic between the performance and reception of taste, a tasteful self-creation, actually performed the work, potentially, of colonial social exclusion. I will now turn to uh, my attention to the Economic Society Memorias from the 1820s to the 1850s, which fashioned an epistemological and historiographical framework through which to see the disciplinary practices set up by the Reglamento of 1832. Many articles in these years narrate Havana's rising tide of progress, which the elite measured in, in part through the city's adherence to the historically manufactured paradigm of Western civilization. Decolonial theory is considered occidentalism uh, as the early modern emergence of the idea and ideology of the West in Europe and its colonies abroad, an ontology constructed in and through the rhetoric of the West itself as civilization. In 1823, an article in the Memorias appeared on the state of the arts of Greece in which the quote unquote progress of the arts is discussed as belonging to different stages or grades of civilization propelled by a discovery and invention. The author locates a counter tradition for such progress in Asia as a foil to Europe when he contends, quote, it is not then in the history of the Eastern nations that the, the march of the human spirit must be studied, unquote. The history of such nations was murky and their extant monuments lacking. By contrast, the Greeks had provided many resources that, have in, that had instructed nosotros, had instructed us, the we of the Western world, including Havana, on the developing state of Greek art in successive centuries. Western society should therefore align itself with a discernible and linear progression of Greek art, a notion shaped to some extent perhaps by the work of German art historian and archeologist Johann Winkelmann. The issue of civilization follows quickly in the article with the notion that from the point at which Greek culture emerged from barbarism, until the time when Greek history ended, a consistent order and thread of knowledge can be traced, understood, and applied. The author holds out Greece, therefore, as the paradigm of perfection, taste, simplicity, and proportions amongst quote-unquote other nations, including Egypt and those of Asia. And I should say that this article is, is by no means by itself. It, the kind of discourse reappears not only here, but also in the 19th century newspapers in which these sentiments are sort of echoed. Uh, the Memorias of 1838-39 to frame the fine arts explicitly in social as well as civilizing terms. The author suggests that efforts in modern times to impart the kind of value that the fine arts enjoyed uh, in the brightest centuries affirms that, quote, their development marks the state of society. They are, it is to say, the mirror of life. They have a great influence on the customs of people, and their decline or advancement is marked in history with characters of blood, unquote. Greece, again, is given as the foundation for good taste, the Romans having copied the Greeks. The author marshals the cultural authority of the ancient Mediterranean to valorize the fine arts themselves, considering, considered fundamental to political 
and social progress. The article continues, quote, the fine arts which are supposed to form the basis of the people's enlightenment are considered powerless in the current state of societies to make them necessary in the political order of nations, unquote. According to the Memorias, the relative development of the fine arts marked a society's level of civilization and required the forming of schools for the promotion of taste, the collecting of models, and the teaching of principles. These discourses in Havana suggest the local enunciation of ideas and practices found in the global Spanish Enlightenment and raise questions about their local signification. When the author mentions a decline in the customs of people as marked in history by characters of blood, for example, could his readers have understood these words to possess connotations of slave rebellion on an island overwhelmingly dependent upon enslaved labor? From these publications and other sources, we can see that the economic society in Havana viewed San Alejandro as an instrument of 19th century progress, a means of helping the city to align itself with the evolving narrative construction of Western modernity. If considered further from a decolonial perspective, however, these rhetorics of buen gusto and civilization function to conceal something, what I previously referred to as the coloniality of aesthetics. Anibal Quijano's notion of coloniality describes a structure of management that undergirds modernity's brilliant narratives of progress and civilization. This concept offers us a means, potentially, of grappling with and rethinking the disciplinary dynamics, perhaps articulated by a figure like Foucault, in order to make them relevant to the modernity coloniality that emerged after 1492 in the Americas, beginning in the Caribbean. By 1815, Spain had issued the Cédula de Gracias, a decree aimed at encouraging white immigration to the waning empire's Caribbean colonies with promises of land and naturalization. A few years later, the Havana elite founded the Junta de Población Blanca, Council of the White Population, to identify additional ways of increasing the number of whites in Cuba. In the essay, The Arts Are in the Hands of the People of Color, which appeared in 1831 as part of La Vigancia, or Vagrancy, in Cuba, the Cuban professor, Jose Antonio Sacco, condemns people of African descent on the island and their participation in the arts. He writes, quote, among the enormous evils that this African race has brought to our land is that they have alienated our white population from the arts. In this deplorable situation, he continues, no white Cuban could be expected to devote himself to the arts because the mere fact of embracing them was taken to mean that he renounced the privileges of his class, unquote. In this passage, Sacco identifies the crucial race-class conjunction that dominated Cuban society in the 19th century as he simultaneously crafts an exclusionary line through the notion of the fine arts between the landscapes of white and black on the island. As the members of Havana's elite generated a discourse on the city's progress and tastefulness while the academy taught aesthetic practices to white students, these entities crafted a realm of cultural production that elevated whiteness as associated with taste and consigned blackness increasingly to degeneracy. One final case is in how the sequence of economic memorias throughout the 1830s and 50s juxtaposed reports on the advancement of the fine arts in Havana via the Academy of San Alejandro with updates on the state of la población blanca, the white population. In the Memorias of 1845, a brief overview of the Academy's drawing exam is immediately followed by an account of the strides that the society had made in that year to increase the island's number of whites, in this case, by seeing the arrival of 100 colonists from the Bordeaux region of France. The conflation of these two projects, the effort to institutionalize the fine arts on the one hand and racial purification on the other, would seem to have conferred racial connotations upon the exclusionary space of the academy. As such, it would appear that San Alejandro emerged as an authorized space for the production of white refinement in relation to discourses about what it meant to be truly human in 19th century Cuba. Thank you. Okay, I think we're going to start again. So we have two more papers from Latin America. The first will be presented by Patricia Zamalea, who is the Associate Professor and Dean of the School of Art and Humanities at the Universidad de 
Los Andes in um, Colombia. She is going to present to us on painting from Bogota. And her research interests range from the global renaissance to the history of the print to classical receptions of, in colonial art. Our second paper and the last for the panel this afternoon will be by Claudia Matos Avalose. She's professor of art history at the University of Campesinas in Brazil. You know her because she already spoke to you today. Um, her research interests range broadly. Um, she is particularly interested in artistic and cultural transfer between Brazil and Europe. And this afternoon, she's also going to talk to us about painting, but from Rio. So we'll do one and then the other, and then everybody comes on stage and we'll have our chat. Okay? Patricia. So once again, before starting, I'd like to thank Claudia and Yukio, and of course Caroline and everyone at the Clark uh, for this wonderful organization and just for getting us here to think about this and making us think about this. Portrayed in this commemorative painting, Pedro José Figueroa is often seen as a transitional artist linking the colonial period to the development of 19th century Republican art in the emerging nation of what is now modern day Colombia. In these two maps, you can see the shift in political organization that took place from the viceregal period on the left to the independence processes that led to the formation of modern Latin American nations. The argument about Figueroa's transitional status is usually stylistic, as you can see here with the painting on the left, which is uh, the death of one of the, let's say, independence, uh, pro-independence heroes, and usually said to be uh, based on colonial paintings, religious paintings. But it is also a political issue for Figueroa, as did other artists, overlapped politics by working both for the viceroyalty and for the independence heroes, even portraying one of the Spanish generals, Pablo Murillo here on the right, who tried to retake the territory from the Criollo rebels. The sequence of paintings reflects the shifting political powers with the same artists at play. From the Spanish king painted by Figueroa's master, Antonio del Campo, to the left, to a viceregal portrait done by Figueroa and another major 18th century portraitist, and a portrait of Simón Bolívar as well as that of Morillo, both by Figueroa. Best known for his portraits of Simón Bolívar and other independence heroes of the 19th century, Figueroa had a family workshop which trained a significant number of pupils who went on to become influential artists. So here's Figueroa his sons. In addition to his own sons, these included miniaturists and portrait painters, but also renowned caricaturists, writers, and historians, such as Jose Manuel Grot, portrayed here, as well as Luis Garcia Evia, both an innovative painter and photographer, and also the author of our portrait. The direct connection of the workshop to the Figueroa family of colonial painters remains unclear, but has often been claimed as a way of establishing his continuity to the artistic traditions of the colonial period. Signed by his pupil, Luis Garcia Evia, and dated 1836, the portrait of Figueroa is both a tribute and a self-conscious image that reflects on the value of likeness and explicitly declares a series of classical principles for the construction of the ideal image. As we shall see, the relationship between master and pupil is a key issue for understanding the theories posited by this painting. If the thesis is correct, this painting then provides evidence for the circulation of theories about artistic creation well before the founding of the first official academy in Colombia. The story of this image, I believe, speaks to the ways in which the seemingly opposing notions of colonial and republican art, later academic art, were construed and understood by different actors throughout the 19th century. Indeed, an analysis of this painting, which has largely gone unnoticed, may be key for understanding the particular ways in which academic art developed in Colombia, 
both by what and how it represents, but also because of the way it interlaces three different generations of artists. On the one hand, that of Pedro José Figueroa, who lived between circa 1770 and 1838, represented here, and that of his pupil, Luis García Evia, who lived between 1816 and 1887, the creator of this image, and the first to innovate with daguerreotypes in Colombia, an issue that I will emphasize while considering local discussions regarding imitation and observation. Apparently bequeathed by García Evia, the painting later belonged to Alberto Urdaneta, a major writer, artist, and public figure related to the first official academy in Colombia, founded in 1873, but only effectively established under Urdaneta in 1886. Although we will come back to this later, let me just say that Urdaneta owned the painting and exhibited it publicly in a particular and definitive context towards the end of the century. If, in that context, this portrait served as an excuse to celebrate the classical principles of academic art, it also served to trace the genealogical connection of academic art to colonial art, a particular issue at stake for late 19th century discussions surrounding the values of national art. As we shall see, some of the tensions underlying this image also point to debates regarding imitation and observation which ensued with the rise of photography and to the tensions between past and present which served to define the very principles of academic art. Let me pause for just a minute in order to contextualize the issue of academic art in Colombia before going back to our image. The question is which academic art? The tra traditional founding date for the first official Academy of Colombia oscillates between 1873, with the creation of an official law meant to set up a national academy for the arts, and its actual inauguration in 1886. The 1873 law declared the need for stimulating the arts as what can be read as part of a civilizatory project. The academy was to be named the Vasquez Academy after the celebrated 17th century artist Gregorio Vasquez, and was to have five schools, painting, engraving, music, sculpture, and architecture. In 1886, the School of Fine Arts was finally established under the direction of Alberto Urdaneta. Compared to other Latin American nations, this is often considered as late by the historiography, as we saw in the two previous talks with uh, Mexico and C Cuba, just to give you a couple of examples. The mapping of earlier attempts to create artistic academies in Colombia, including Luis García Evia's Drawing Academy of 1843 and his project together with other artists for an Academy of Drawing and Painting in 1846, shows that there were a variety of short-lived initiatives. Other cases include the 1850s National Institute for Science and Fine Arts. However, these are usually seen as frustrated attempts, and historians often set the beginnings of academic art in the 1880s. So I hope you've been following that as I've been uh, talking about these different attempts, and you can see our painting um, where it belongs up here. Yet a more nuanced approach to the subject of academic art and its meanings, one that takes into account the multivalent and shifting uses of images and what these may say about circulating ideas about art, may offer a different type of narrative regarding academic art in Colombia in particular and globally in general. Some art historians have pointed to the, quote, singularity of 19th century Colombian artists most of whom were involved at one point or another in the various political and military conflicts that spanned the century. On the one hand, the participation of these artists in these settings underlines the development of a first-hand witness approach to art. In addition to battle paintings, such as those by Jose Maria Espinosa on your lower right, who fought in the independence wars, Artists such as García Evia began using photography in order to record specific events, such as this image of three criminals before their execution, or this view of the Church of San Agustín after, after it was taken by centralist, the Centralist Army during the Civil War of 1860-62. to 62. Both of these were actually album and prints that were sold in multiples. 
At the same time, according to this very narrative, the ongoing political conflicts did not allow for the development of proper art academies and institutions. The narrative goes on to posit that, therefore, individual artists made it on their own. According to this historiographic thread, two heroic models stand out. Jose Maria Spinoza, who you see here in a self-portrait to the left, one of the official painters of Simon Bolivar and who explored a variety of genres throughout the 19th century, and to the right, Ramon Torres Mendes, uh, known also for his paintings of everyday life uh, scenes. Both of them are usually seen as exceptional rather than the norm. Nonetheless, a perspective that includes networks and emphasizes continuities rather than just starting points may offer a richer understanding of what academic art meant and how it was valued in relationship to the past, both classical and colonial, in a particular context with its own local histories and specificities while dialoguing with a global context. Let me go back to our image to see how some of these issues play out in one work of art. Set on a hexagonal stone base, this oval portrait shows a three-quarter figure wearing a bow tie, a flower-laced vest, and a blue dress coat, a clear marker of the protagonist's social status. Framed within an oval, encircled by laurel leaves, this format, and in general its composition, evokes other allegorical portraits, such as the flesh-colored bust of Jose Celestino Mutis, the famed naturalist who led the viceregal botanical expedition from 1783 until the beginnings of the independence process. Unlike the Mutis bust, which also rests on a pedestal but is incorporated into a landscape, Garcia Evia's portrait inserts its protagonist onto a different level of representation, an image within an image, as a way of reflecting on the permanence and presence of images, not unlike Bartolomé Murillo's self-portrait of circa 1670, which also circulated as a print and suggestively reads Bartolomé Murillo portraying himself to fulfill the wishes and prayers of his beloved children or sons. Both the laurel and the base are classicizing features that respond to an existing tradition in portraiture. In addition to the palette as a painter's attribute and a clear reference for artistic activity, a handwritten poem set on a folding paper that nicely follows the border of the stone base provides specific information about the protagonists of this image. At the same time, it expounds art theoretical notions, in particular about the art of imitation, the role of memory and observation in the process of artistic creation. That's, that's my attempt at translating the poem, though of course the rhymes don't uh, no longer read properly in the English. In the art of Apelles, great talent, exquisite taste, pleasant fantasy, with its endearing love, a monument my nation consecrates to your virtue. You inspired me with a generous breath when hearing your lessons at some other time. Weak copy, hoping it could reproduce the image that my faithful chest venerates. The implied comparison of the art behind the commissioned portrait to the renowned ancient Greek painter Apelles, and therefore to antiquity in a more general sense, along with the use of classical topoi regarding the ability of painting to recall and represent, showed that these commonplace ideas about art theory were known to the circle of artists. The emphasis on the weakness of the copy and the nostalgic desire for a correct reproduction of the mental image, or rather an image that is close to the heart, indicate a neoplatonic perspective that connects the notions of image, copy, memory, and presence. In a more general sense, the poem evokes concepts connected to long-standing ideas regarding creativity, in particular, the notions of fantasy denoting invention and the ability to give life to a representation, while suggesting that the master is whom transmitted to his pupil, once upon a time, the ability of breathing life onto the image. By the way, in Spanish, aliento means breath, but it also carries an existential significance. Likewise, the notion that mental images outlive us and endure beyond our time is present throughout this representation, 
The verses end with a nostalgic tone, under the impression that no matter how vivid the recalled image is, its complete reproduction is virtually impossible to achieve and our creations are only weak copies. This false modesty is another commonplace. The inherent notion is that behind such tributes to a master is the ever-present idea that the pupil inherits talent but also surpasses it. The pupil, Garcia Evia, has written these verses and establishes a simultaneous paragone in terms of an ut pictura poesis, the ancient comparison between poetry and painting, not just for writing in verse and knowing his classical references, but also due to the different levels of representation present in the painting, all of which ultimately collapses two generations of artists. Whether a posthumous portrait or intended as an intellectual tribute to an aging master, the notion that the portrait was executed by memory, that is, remembering without its model present, is part of the playful evocation of artistic theory. Interestingly, there is not much in the painting that could be identified with the characteristic art of Figueroa. Neither can the verisimilitude evoked in the poetic pamphlet be connected to Figueroa, whose art is often perceived as an archaic, anti-naturalistic colonial approach in which flat spaces predominate. The only hint might be the colors placed on the palette. The characteristic reds, ochres, and whites used by Figueroa, which depart from the tonalities of this portrait. In any case, the emphasis placed on verisimilitude not only breaks with the historiographic reception of Figueroa, but also calls for a reflection on what verisimilitude meant in different historical contexts. One of the few written testimonies related to the reception and valuing of Figueroa featured in the writings of Josefa Acevedo de Gomez, also portrayed by Garcia Evia and known for her descriptions of daily life in mid-19th century Colombia. In her reminiscings of early 19th century Bogota, then called Santa Fe, in her book titled Paintings of the Private Lives of Some Neogranadinos, she uses Figueroa's art to describe the interior home decorations of noble men and women of the city. I quote, which is what you see in red, Figueroa's images of saints with thick ornamented and golden frames along with family portraits executed in oil were placed as close as possible to the ceilings. And here she's taught, discussing the old way of decorating homes by contrast with the more modern mid 19th century way. So she's actually seeing Figueroa as something that belongs to a different period. From this perspective, Figueroa was still a reference point for the mid-19th century and occupied a preeminent role in the imagination, albeit one tied to the past. As for the concept of the nation, or patria, which commissions the portrait, if you notice uh, the nation is the actual subject of the verses, it is important to note that by the time that Garcia Evia painted Figueroa's portrait, Bolivar, this political entity of the Gran Colombia, Great Colombia, which included Ecuador, Panama, Venezuela, parts of Peru and Brazil with Colombia, had fallen apart. The central entities of the Gran Colombia were reorganized into the Republic of Nueva Granada, and the notion of patria or nation began emerging in a more specific sense of what would be now modern day Colombia. The common idea that artists and their works went beyond politics and were in fact a point of unity for those in discord was beginning to emerge and would be reiterated towards the end of the century. It was in this context that Figueroa was claimed as one of the nation's sons. The self-consciousness of this painting reflects Garcia Evia's experimental approach to image making. For Garcia Evia was a multifaceted, innovative artist who became involved with early experiments with photography ever since the arrival of daguerreotypes to Colombia. Daguerreotypes arrived early on in Colombia, thanks to Baron Jean-Baptiste Louis Croix, a French diplomat who lived in Colombia between 1838 and 1842. Indeed, one of the first daguerreotypes of the history of photography records a city scene in Bogota taken by uh, the Baron, which you see here to the right. And to the left, you see uh, one of the compositions of the daguerreotypes hung in his home. In 1840, 
in 1841, Garcia Evia actually won the third prize in, prize in the industrial exhibition with two of his own daguerreotypes. By the 1850s, Garcia Evia owned a daguerreotype gallery together with the North American John Armstrong Bennett, who had arrived in 1848, and publicized tailor-made portraits according to size and price. In addition to popularizing the access to portraits, this business allowed Garcia Evia to shift the direction of his art making while increasing his production. Their publicity also reflected on the impending need of preserving the image of the deceased. Reflecting on the uncertainty of life, the texts begin with exclamatory calls. Quote, what I would give for the portrait of a friend this exclamation no longer means what it used to. Only the guiltiest ones may say it, for the price of these paintings should not be a barrier, for even the poorest may acquire such a desirable object of consolation." End quote. Another ad from 1853, quote, guarantees the exactness and beauty of those portrayed. Garcia Evia went on to experiment with crossover media. He began applying oil on the daguerreotypes, calling them oleotypos or oleotypes, and publicizing their verisimilitude. Quote, these imitate nature even more, for in addition to the exact likeness offered by the machine, one adds the verisimilitude offered by color, colorido, with all the beauty and softness of oil, and the advantage of duration offered by ancient pictures, end quote. As noted by other scholars, some of Garcia Evia's later painted portraits seem to recall photographic resemblances and may even have used photographs of deceased men and women as his basis. Likewise, portraying men and women from memory or when deceased had been a practice of his in the early 1840s, as you can see in one of his very well-known paintings uh, to the right, the death of one of the independence uh, heroes though of course it's also based on a colonial model, as you can see on the left. If resemblance and verisimilitude were issues in painting, they became even more complicated with the use of photography. By the end of the 19th century, the use of photographic references in painting became a major debate in artistic circles and in the academy. Garcia Evia was also a collector of colonial paintings, many of which, as did his daguerreotypes, passed on to Alberto Urdaneta, the founder of the first official academy. After traveling to Europe in the 1860s, Urdaneta had come back to emphasize the need for art academies and aided in the promulgation of the ambitious 1873 law, which was unsuccessful on a large scale, but allowed for the setting up of an engraving school directed by Urdaneta, which produced a significant number of historical engravings published in his journal, the Papel Periódico Ilustrado. And here you're seeing a repertoire of some of these engravings of heroes that were uh, published constantly. When the Fine Arts School was finally opened in 1886, coinciding with the rise of a conservative government, it was inaugurated with an exhibition showing over 2,000 objects from a variety of collections. And this, too, was printed in the Papel Periódico Ilustrado in Urdaneta's journal. The Figueroa portrait, we know, was shown alongside old masters and colonial paintings of the first annual exhibition of the School of Fine Arts organized, of course, by Urdaneta. The notion that Colombian art history began with colonial art and that colonial art was comparable to the great European masters was at the heart of the founding of the academy and at the exaltation of academic art. A catalog was printed in the style of French exhibition catalogs with the objective of emphasizing for a broader public the idea that art had always been a rich and continuous activity in Colombia. Analyzed by Ricardo Malagón, the catalog shows the emphasis placed on certain media and subject matter, so basically uh, religious and painting as media well beyond the other uh, media. The Figueroa portrait was later included and described in another publication, the Workshop Museum of Alberto Urdaneta, a catalog of Urdaneta's collection published after his death in 1888. And it was cataloged as 
the portrait of the noble painter of Bogota, Don Pedro Figueroa, made by his pupil Luis Garcia Evia in 1836, which includes verses and in parentheses because he was fond of writing verses as was Acero. The author of this catalog was invoking a direct connection to a learned artist from the colonial period, Antonio Acero de la Cruz, known for his erudite paintings and writings. Such impressions strongly supported by the first academics were at the roots of an emerging 20th century conception of colonial art as something distinct and distinguishable as a historical entity. As can be seen in this portrait of the secretary of the academy in the late 1920s, executed by the director of the academy at this time, so this is the secretary, and Cano is the director of the academy at the time. As can be seen here, the images surrounding the protagonist are key for understanding this very concept. If, on the one hand, a religious painting set here is recognizable as one by Gregorio Vazquez, who came to represent the master of the colonial period, and as you'll remember, the first name for the academy was the Vazquez Academy. On the opposite side, you recognize it here, is the portrait of Alberto Urdaneta, understood as the founding father of an academy with clear roots in colonial art. In conclusion, to think about academic art in a Latin American context challenges not only traditional dates, but also the very notion of what academic art means and how it relates to the classical past and to modernity in at the same time. To look at the development of academic art in a local context through the lens of Garcia Evia's portrait of Figueroa and its many lives during the 19th century, the interrelated notions of colonial, classical, and academic are complicated. While the painting evidences that classical tradition imbued early and mid-19th century Colombian artistic practice and theory, in the academic context under Urdaneta, it also served as an excuse to celebrate the classical principles of academic art and to trace the genealogical connection of academic art to colonial art. Finally, the multiple intersections between painting and photography arriving almost half a century before the founding of the Columbian Academy complicate the matter of verisimilitude as an underlying principle of academic art even further. And the question becomes, which classical past and which notion of modernity? Thank you. Well, hello once again. I want to reiterate my thanks to everyone at the Clark for hosting this symposium. It has been wonderful up to this moment, and I'm sure it's going to be amazing all the way to the end. Um, I was kind of um, wondering what to present here, um, if I should actually present um, like the inst institutional aspects related to the Brazilian case or the Brazilian Academy, or if I should actually try to focus on one example. And in the end, I decided for the second option. So I'm going to speak about one painting, basically. And this painting is actually dated later in the history of the Academy. Um, but I'm very happy that we have a lot of discussion time. So if anyone has questions about the development of the academy, um, institutional questions, please feel free to ask me later. So, so I'll go to the history of our painting here. So what happens when the French academy, its doctrine and its culture migrates beyond Europe to become an interactive model to art institutions across the world. This is one of the central questions of the present symposium. 
My aim today is to re revisit the problem by looking at what had been called or has been called Orientalism throughout one specific case study taken from Brazil, Oscar Pereira da Silva's painting, The Slave, today known as The Roman Slave. How do I make it go forward? <laughs> Sorry. Um, Orientalism became a dominant cultural trend in France academic art experience in the second half of the 19th century, and it quickly spread throughout the wide networks linking the French Academy to numerous art institutions across the world. In France, as, you know, if in France, as Christine Peltry points out, Orientalism was the cultural face of French imperialism. Outside France, on the other hand, the fascination with the Orient frequently acquired new connotations as it adapted to local environments. In, 1890, in 1894, while still a pensioner of the Brazilian government studying in Paris, under the guidance of Jean-Léon Jérôme and Louis Bonnard, Oscar Pereira da Silva sent a group of seven paintings to the first general exhibition organized by the Escola Nacional de Belas Artes, or the National School of Fine Arts, a heir to the Imperial Academy, extinguished by the new Republican government in 1889. Um, um, among these, these pictures was a historicized academy uh, registered in the general exhibition catalog under the title The Slave. And we're seeing it right here. I mean, <laughs> one version of it. It represented a young woman with long dark hair and swarthy skin, right hand resting on her waist and reclining against an old wall with balcony topped by what seemed to be a closed wooden window of an oriental market stand. Um, the kind that we can find in some paintings of Jérôme, for instance. She is almost entirely naked, wearing only what appears to be a light white undergown and a heavy textile wrapped around her waist, or her left hip, and held by a golden belt decorated with medallions and various inset stones. The cloth falling in large folds is plain brown on the outside, but colorfully decorated with stripes and flower patterns inside, both belt and textile alluding to the richness of oriental costumes. Her head is slightly tilted to her right, resting back against the wooden window. This brings her chin upwards while she, uh, she stares at the spectator with tired, melancholic eyes. She is barefoot and her right leg slightly bent, bringing all her weight onto one hip. At her left, we see another heavy red textile thrown over a wooden bench and on her right, on the ground, the artist placed a round-based amphora associating her figure with the type of the femme fila, frequently represented by French Orientalist artists, such as Charles Landel, or Léon Auguste Belli, and uh, Léon Bonnard. Um, and it's, um, it is hard to know exactly how the interest for the exotic Orient arrived in Brazilian art environment. However, we know for sure that in 1877, Jean-Léon Jérôme, the renowned French Orientalist painter, who later would receive our artist Oscar Pereira da Silva as student in Paris, became corresponding member of the Brazilian Academy, and that in 1879, in the, ex the general exhibition, Two canvases from Paul de Lemain, Arab Camp and Traveling Bedouins, as well as an odalisque from an artist named Menotti were on display. We also know that during this same decade, Pedro Américo, a professor at the academy who was on leave and working in Europe, produced a series of, of orientalizing paintings with um, 
a series of orientalizing paintings with scenes from the Old Testament, which he um, sent back in 1884 to the general exhibition at the Academy just before he returned to Brazil. Pedro Américo would become one of uh, Pereira da Silva's professor at the uh, Academy in, 18, in the 1880s, and the student would copy the master's work in different occasions. And here is we, I show you one of the copies he made of Pedro Américo's picture. Therefore, when Oscar Pereira da Silva displayed his slave, in 1894, artists and public in Brazil were well acquainted with the vogue of Orientalism that had developed in Europe since the 1830s. And in many cases, however, but in many cases, however, as we will see through the story of this particular painting, the well-established French iconography on an imagined Orient was submitted to processes of dislocation and resignification as it observed, absorbed and mingled with elements of local visual culture. Until very recently, it was believed that the picture exhibited by Oscar Pereira da Silva in 1894 was, some of, was the same that is hanging today in the Pinacoteca do Estado in Sao Paulo. And this is the picture I'm showing you here. However, in 2010, during restoration works, one uh, Oh, restoration works on the, on the picture, doubt was shed upon this identity uh, or the identity of the two pictures, the one exhibited in 1894 and the one hanging at the Pinacoteca um, of the two pictures because um, in the cleaning process, the phrase, a second version of the same painting was revealed under the artist's signature. At the time of this uh, unexpected revelation, I had a student doing research on the same painting for her master thesis. With the new information in hand, Marcella Formico, my student, located another version of the Roman slave in a private collection in Rio de Janeiro, proposing that it was the original version exhibited in 1894. In fact, further research for the present article unearthed more evidence to support this claim. Two years after the 1894 exhibition, a critic from the newspaper O País, uh, writing about a solo show organized by Oscar Pereira da Silva in Sao Paulo, lamented that the slave was not acquired by the Academy at the time of its display, having entered into a private collection of, and I quote, an intelligent amateur named Mr. J. Carvalho, end quote. Shortly after, Pedro uh, uh, Pereira da Silva moved to Sao Paulo and probably created a second version of the painting when already in the city, which entered the state collection some years later. One last piece of uh, information found in the press is key to the discussion about the history of uh, Pereira da Silva's painting, Pro, uh, providing now an important clue about the change of name in the picture from the slave to how it's called today, the Roman slave. On the 3rd of October, 1894, by the occasion of the general exhibition in which the slave was first seen, the newspaper Gazeta de Notícias published a caricature of the painting. And in this painting, uh, the image was accompanied, accompanied with, the second, with the following caps, and I quote, at the fine arts exhibition, poor girl, to pay for the portrait, she had to sell even her body shirt. In this illustration, we do not see the two plates with Roman inscriptions, the one placed on the slave's neck and the one glued on the wall at her left, now present in both the Pinacoteca and in the private collection version. The caps also indicate that the author of the drawing did not see elements in the picture that could justify the title, The Slave. 
The same comment on the arbitrariness of this title can be found in another article published by El País, or no, o País, sorry, on October 13, 1894. Here, the critic notes that, and I quote, the slave has no characteristic that could justify this title. It is a study of a nude in natural size, a proof of great goodwill and, and long, thorough work, but nothing of a picture, none of the less of slavery, just a study. After close examination of the version here um, held today in the private collection, uh, Marcella Formico uh, raised the hypothesis that the plates uh, present in the picture were later additions since the loose strokes of paint, uh, of painted surface strongly disagreed with the rest of the work. According to this suggestion, we could um, uh, reconstruct the story as following. Oscar Pereira da Silva probably painted the slave in Paris, having as reference a well-established iconography of the oriental slave, depicted many times by Jerome himself and his disciples. However, after exhibiting the picture in 1894, he produced a new version, adding the plates with Roman scripts and changing the original title. This on the second picture. Now, this second picture came into the Sao Paulo State Collection in the beginning of the 20th century and is now hanging at the Pinacoteca. The original picture probably stayed in private collections in Rio de Janeiro, passing from hand to hand until it, was, um, it landed in the Hamachotti house where it stands today. The plates on the picture seem to have been added later, maybe to match the famous version of the Pinacoteca. This also raises some important questions about the painting and its uh, changing environment from France to Brazil. Why did the artist feel compelled to produce a new version of this work? And why did he change title and, sub and the theme, dislocating it both temporally and geographically in his second version. Okay. One of the important features of Oscar Pereira da Silva's painting is, that, is the fact that it, is, it represents a white woman, but of darker complexion. The contrast between white and black slaves was well established and clearly codified within the context of French Orientalist painting, uh, where black slaves were um, as a rule, I mean, white slaves were, were as a rule associated to pleasure and black slaves to labor. Jerome himself used this kind of bodily index in a series of paintings of Moorish baths uh, that he painted in the 1870s and 80s. It also appeared in the works of other artists from Jérôme's close circle, such as Jean-Jules Lecombe de Nuit, who had been his student and created his white slave in 1888. Here, Lecombe de Nuit uh, inscribes two completely separate worlds into the image, a world of sensual pleasure and a world of manual labor, connecting them through an implied male observer. This is characteristic of many of Orientalist paintings, the exotic and frequently sexualized uh, character, uh, charged work or sexually charged work is offered to the viewer as, a fixed, as fixed in the distance by avoiding any kind of incorporation of the spectator into the painting. The scene is trapped within the frame, transforming the observer in a voyeur who can secretly enjoy his own fantasies. Oscar Pereira da Silva's slave definitely tackles male fantasies about the Orient present in French bourgeois society in the 19th century. However, the genre is, uh, in which it is painted, a historicized academy, produces a whole new effect on the viewer. Because it was created as an almost natural size study of a real, real nude model, this slave has an unusually strong physical presence. 
She faces the spectator and looks into his eyes while offering her body for someone else's pleasure. This um, introduces a tension and an, an uncomfort or an uncomfortable sense of power relation involved in such encounters, similar to the ones observed by Manuela Carneiro da Cunha in her study of 19th century photographic images of slaves in Brazil. So, quoting uh, Manuela Carneiro da Cunha, she comments, this is the way masters look at slaves, evaluating their work, their discipline, their conformity with Brazilian patterns of beauty. The, photographer, the, photog the pot photography brings into view this gaze and allows us to guess as a detail a gaze retributed by the black person. An absent gaze, a frontal challenging gaze, an affirmation of dignity, an inquiring gaze, giving an account of the various forms of reaction against slavery, to, be oneself, to let oneself die, to kill oneself, um, to buy one's freedom, acquire uh, it by favor from their master, run away, get together in a quilombo, all of this different ways to escape from slavery. Oscar Pereira da Silva grew up in a society marked by slavery and certain, certainly was familiar with this kind of exchange, perpassing the relations between master and their captives, and so was the Brazilian public. In 1894, when he decided on painting this theme in Paris, slavery was abolished in Brazil only six years earlier and was still pretty much present in the minds and experience of everyone in Brazil or in Brazilian society. To understand the shift in meaning that a painting like The Slave may have suffered in its, um, migrated, when it migrated from France into the general exhibition of the Imperial Academy in Rio de Janeiro, it is necessary, therefore, to take the cultural and political climate in Brazil into account, particularly because in this, in this country, an imagined exotic orient with its harems and sultans played a significant role in the shaping of the rhetoric of slave, around slavery during the second half of the 19th century. First of all, it is important to realize that after the 1870s, when following strong international pressure, abolition, the abolition movement in Brazil gained momentum, the Middle East and North Africa were in fact the only other parts of the so-called civilized world where slavery was still in place. This gave partisans pro and against slavery in Brazil a term of comparison that fixed positions around distinctions of race, labor, and pleasure. And this uh, specific framework, abuses of slavery represented throughout the uh, depiction of sexual desire and violence against enslaved women were identified with the Orient, while the exploitation of labor was seen as a more a more legitimate practice. The color of the slave's skin became a central element in this dynamic. In possession, no, uh, the possession of white slaves was seen as abuse practiced by barbarians in the East, while the ownership of black slaves was justified through the idea of race superiority. During the abolitionist campaigns, therefore, light-skinned slaves called mulatas, generally born from illicit relationships between black enslaved women and her master, became the most common signifier of the transposition of these limits, serving as, for abolitionists as means to denounce the violence of slavery as a whole. The most important example here is the novel A Escrava Isaura, or The Slave Isaura, very popular um, until today, like every kid has to read that like for school, published in 1875 by Bernardo Guimarães. The novel um, was a huge success and played a significant role in the campaigns against slavery at the time. 
Isaura was the daughter of a black slave who was violated by her master and died subsequently uh, during um, birth labor. She was born with such light skin that, um, as expressed by one of the characters of the book, and I quote, no one would ever say that a single drop of African blood ran in her veins. Because of her beauty, the master's wife, who only had a son, Leoncio, decided to take her into the household and educate her as her own daughter, teaching her foreign languages and music. After the woman passed away, Isaura was inherited by Leoncio and his wife to serve in their household. However, Leoncio burns with desire for Isaura and wants to use his position as master to force himself upon her. As extreme remedy, Isaura decides to flee to the northeast of Brazil, where she meets the rich, handsome abolitionist uh, Álvaro, who falls in love with her and buys her from Leonso to make her his wife. What is of notice here, however, is that throughout the whole novel, in several occasions when Leoncio's intentions are denounced, the author, the author of the book builds upon associations with the Orient, calling him a sultanzinho or a little sultan. The connections uh, between slavery and an imagined or Orient also appears in Castro Alves' famous collection of poems, The Slave. Castro Alves is considered like the abolitionist poet of Brazil, very, like a very, very preeminent poet. And the book was published in 1884. This book compiles 34 poems in which all but the first one is written from the perspective of black slaves, Brazilian black slaves, who express their suffering in captivity. In contrast to this, the opening poem named The, the Swart of the Dadger um, evokes a dreamlike orient inspired in the classic Thousand and One Nights. It describes a sumptuous palace with beautiful women in a harem uh, protected by guards. This sweet, magical environment presented in two, in two long stanzas is abruptly cut short by the last verse of the poem, where the author suddenly states that the sultan's concubine is not his favorite anymore, thus implying that she will now die by the dagger announced by the title. Introducing the theme of slavery through, the initial, through this initial poem, Castro Alves makes clear, makes clear that his direct association of slavery in Brazil with the perverse desires and powers that he direct, directly associated the perversity of slavery in Brazil with powers of an oriental sultan. Oscar Pereira da Silva's The Slave could not have remained untouched by such associations between slavery and an imaginary exotic orient. In fact, hanging on the walls of the academy in its original version without the inscribed plates, it clearly incorporated such ambiguities. Although most critics uh, reacted to the painting by totally dismissing its title and considering the work a mere academy or a study of nude, as we saw above, in at least one case, the oriental captive uh, triggered a reaction of uncomfort due to the allusions to Brazilian slavery. Referring to Oscar Pereira da Silva's painting, in his review of the 1894 Salon, a critic from the Jornal do Brasil remarked with irony, the slave that exposed in a market, as we can expect, would never find buyers, if not for the volupio, volupious uh, demands of the providers of beauties to the harems." Uh, end quote. As Oscar Pereira da Silva may have uh, been support, uh, no. Oscar Pereira da Silva may have been uh, surprised by the reaction to the slave at the Academy Salon in 1894, realizing that the public did not easily recognize the subject of his painting. 
This may have led him to add the written plates in a second version of the work. But they did. Uh, but why did he decide uh, on a geographic and temporal dislocation of the theme uh, from the Orient to antique Rome? This is, there is no document or statement from the part of the artist or anyone else that could provide a definite answer to this question. However, based on the analysis of the ecosystem in which uh, Pereira da Silva and his painting entered when returning to Brazil, we might dare to speculate. Oscar Pereira da Silva had studied in the academy during the imperial period. In 1887, in the last general exhibition held by the institution before the beginning of the Republican period, he was awarded the travel prize to Europe for his painting, Flagellation of Christ, a picture inspired in the work of, on the work of the same uh, name or title by Victor Meirelles, one of the older professors at the academy. At that moment, the academy was going through a big crisis, torn between the defenders of old academic values and the progressive group of professors longing for reform. Two of the, the latter, uh, Zeferino da Costa and Rodolfo Bernardelli, sat in the travel, the travel Prize Committee that year and did not agree with the decision to grant the prize to Pereira da Silva, referring, uh, preferring uh, Belmiro de Almeida, a student most, most, much more aligned with their own position, their own more liberal position. Um, when their vote was defeated, they turned to the press in protest, using the prize as an example of the urgency to reform the academy. Oscar Pereira da Silva was then caught in midst of the battle and his art was identified by the press as an example of the low quality of the academic art education system and its output. And here well, we can see Bernardelli and um, Zeferino da Costa here on the left with all the other professors as donkeys examining Oscar Pereira da Silva's painting. Mm, okay. Oscar Pereira da Silva was then caught missed in the battle. No? Due to all the public pressure, the Academy decided to cancel the award, and Oscar Pereira da Silva had to wait until 1891 to finally be granted the stipend after much difficulty not to get it. However, when he returned from Europe three years later, the press still identified him as a pensioner of the old empire. This, um, this uh, became particularly problematic after he moved to Sao Paulo, where the intellectual elite was strongly committed to Republican values, and Sao Paulo has like, this leading role in the proclamation of the Republic in Brazil. So uh, for him, being in Sao Paulo was uh, being much more tightly engaged with the Republicans at that moment. Um, yeah, so. In this, um, in, this next, in this new context, Oscar Pereira da Silva may have uh, thought that uh, that challenging, uh, changing the title of his second version of the painting from slave to the Roman slave would give him an opportunity to align himself with the Republicans by identifying slavery with the empire through the already consolidated reference to Rome uh, um, as was very usual uh, in the iconography. In fact, there was an important precedent to this uh, within the academy itself. In 1892, Rodolfo Bernardelli, who had become the director of the institution, and this is the same person who was at the committee uh, uh, that didn't want to give um, Pereira da Silva the prize. So Rodolfo Bernardelli, who now was the director of the institution, had also changed the title of one of his pictures, painted in 1886, so during the imperial period, um, from Dic Dictariade uh, to Messalina, before offering to sell it to the school collection. 
In the case of Oscar Pereira da Silva's slave, the change of title was accompanied by the addition of plates with Roman scripts for which he could certainly have seen a series of models or examples, particularly on paintings produced by Jérôme's close friend, um, um, Gustave Boulanger. And here, okay, okay, I'm really almost finished. So here we have like a Roman market and like a more contemporary version of a North, North African slave market. Hanging in the Pinacoteca today, the Roman, the Roman slave uh, brings together so many worlds and worldviews. It resonates ideas as, uh, surrounding gender, race, and attitude towards the other, present both in France and in Brazilian societies of the time. However, all the imaginary is put into place around a central absence, the black slave. This fact is not accidental. It is known that slavery was abolished in 1888 in Brazil with no plan for integrating the black population into society. On the contrary, mechanisms of exclusion and segregation were put into place to obstruct any kind of black agency in all levels of society. A picture like Oscar Pereira da Silva's slave uh, stages the central absence. It shows how the transformation from, imp from empire to republic uh, uh, also meant accommodating much of continuities within the Brazilian society, allowing structures of power and domination to live on until our days. Thank you.